Hello, and welcome to None of the Above. My name is Steve Nemirovsky, and I'm your host. On None of the Above, we examine why the political system is dysfunctional and polarized. And on every show, we try and bring you solutions uh, and try and get you involved to do what you can to help minimize this dysfunction and polarization, and move our political system and our government to a better place. We're going to hit on a couple of our favorite topics today. In fact, my favorite topic is always what it's going to take to get more people to run for office and make a difference. Uh, we want you to run for office, and we've had a few shows where we've tried to educate you on places you can go to learn how to run for office. Had a great uh, interview, if you haven't seen it, um, with the Women's Candidate School from Yale University. They have an annual school that they run in June, terrific program. And we've had other programs where we've tried to talk about what it takes to run for office and how to get you how to get you there. Um, another theme we talk about, and it's a personal prejudice of mine, but also a sweet, sweet spot for our guest today, is I think we need more women in government, more women uh, in leadership. Uh, I just think we have to balance the system out. Uh, one of my favorite lines is from a state legislator I used to work with, and sometimes she'd come out of the room and she said, just a little too much testosterone in that room. And I know what she was talking about. So today we're going to interview Aaron uh, Velarde, She's formed a terrific organization called Vote, Run, Lead, and it does a, some great things. Among other things, starting with the word vote, she's trying to get people to vote. And we talk about that on the show, too. If people don't vote, the system can't work. And then she's talking about run, which is run for office, and, and lead. She's trying to create leadership. So it's a great organization. You can find them at voterunlead.org. And we're going to find out more from Erin, uh, her vision, and her program. So Erin, welcome to None of the Above. Thanks for having me. So before the show, I was telling you, I want to get to Vote, Run, Lead, but I was reading your bio, and I think I got a great bio, so I think I want to do a little bit on who's, who's Aaron. Sure. Well, first and foremost, I'm a Jersey girl, born and raised. Um, what, what, part and of, what part of Jersey? I'm from South Jersey, actually. All right. By the shore, by the Jersey right. shore. South Jersey's great. I went, to, I went to school in Philly. I had a lot of friends from Jersey. Nice. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and, you know... Very early on, my sister had gone to a women's college, and being 10 years my senior, she started to send home Ms. Magazine to me, um, and that was a big part of my feminist awakening uh, around women in power, and being a, you know, a subscriber in the eighth grade to uh, Ms. Magazine is probably a unique thing, but it did a lot to expose me to some of the, not only here in the United States, but the global um, lives of women around the world. Well, you were uh, probably a little bit ahead of your time reading Ms. in eighth grade. Um, in your bio, it says you are a leadership development consultant. What a great sounding title. What is a leadership development consultant, and what, and what do you do? Sure. So for many years, I worked with businesses, nonprofits, um, some corporations to think about how we advance women in leadership positions. Uh, what are some of the latest strategies, the latest research? I worked with the Athena Center for Leadership Studies at Barnard College, Columbia University, to create something called the Athena Core 10, which was 10 leadership principles um, that we felt really reflected what women leaders actually bring to those posts. Um, we took a look at the Harvard Business Review leadership uh, qualities and felt that it wasn't actually covering some of the skills that we know women need to get ahead, such as self-advocacy and uh, the skill of listening um, and how critical that is for um, working with teams and managing others um, and some of the unique barriers that women and women of color face when ascending to leadership and some of the assumptions we make about women and their qualifications. Um, so what I've done is, you know, I worked with a great group uh, through the Yahoo Business and Human Rights Division with women all over the world, um, thinking about the intersections between governmental leadership, um, private sector leadership, public sector leadership. Um, and that really, one of the regions we, we went to was the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. And uh, in Cairo, Egypt, did a, uh, was a consultant for one of their big conferences on women's leadership and really saw how technology was also advancing the conversation about women in leadership and democracy. Um, it was around the Arab Spring. And so that really got me thinking about the US and how we were not yet using technology. There were a few groups, groups like Ultraviolet that were using the move on, um, you know, sort of petition style activism online, but that we were yet to sort of figure out how to create a leadership movement using technology and given women the skills and access 
to actually you know, self-actualize what it is they wanted to do. Um, and for me, my passion is very much in the political space. Um, you know, I did big trainings for the Hershey Corporation and HSBC, um, but my heart is really in our democracy. And um, I think that women have a quicker route to power and you see a greater influence on others' lives when we're working with women in leadership and politics. So maybe this is a distinction without a difference or difference without a distinction, but are you taking women who are in leadership posts and training them to be better leaders, or are you taking women who are not in leadership at all and trying to groom them to become leaders, or, a little, or maybe a little of each? A little of each. It's both and. Um, and right at Vote, Run, Lead, we're definitely doing both and because there aren't enough women in the political space to begin with. There aren't enough female campaign managers and chief of staff to be plucking from in the talent pool. Um, and so you have to do both. You have to go to folks who are already in leadership positions in public life and pull them over and talk about how the skills they have, the skills they have built in, in public service or in their private sector lives are exactly the kind of experiences and transferable skills to get into politics. And then you have to have folks who, um, you know, younger women especially, who may not have that kind of resume just yet. How do they build that civic resume? Um, and how do they take a leap um, and consider themselves a potential candidate at, say, 25 or 26 years old? So, so you did some of this through the uh, Athenia Core 10 project. And then uh, that, I think that morphs into something bitter, bigger. You were at the, the White House project. I, I don't know much about the White House project, but while you were there, you developed the concept for Vote Run Lead, correct? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, and I actually was an intern at the White House Project, which was a women's NGO working on women in leadership across sectors in politics, media, and business. And I got to start Vote Run Lead there as the political program. Um, and ran it as a traditional political field program. Um, folks might have heard of Wellstone Action or, you know, we got in our cars, we traveled all over the country and, you know, asked women to run for office because we know you have to encourage and recruit. Um, and we actually took around the Shirley Chisholm film, uh, at the documentary about Chisholm's race uh, for the presidency in 1972, Unbought and Unbossed, which was really powerful to show those kind of role models. Um, and we did a lot of GOTV in 2004. And then the next year we went back in 05 to train them. And over the course of eight, about eight years through Vote Run Lead, we trained about 15,000 women, um, about half women of color. And now using technology, the sort of second iteration of Vote Run Lead as a standalone organization, now celebrating our third anniversary this month, we have already trained uh, a little over 8,000 women in just three years using tech, the combination of you know, in-person and online classes. And so really working to accelerate the number of women we're reaching through technology. And, um, and that stint in the middle that I did with you know, private corporations and the university really helped me to leverage and understand that um, and, and to learn from our international sisters that we needed to find new ways because women were very hungry and thirsty for the education about how to lead and especially how to lead in government. So as I said, I, want, I wanted to do a little bit on you and I think our, my viewers have a good sense of who you are and particularly the, this enormous energy uh, and vitality you're bringing to the project. And I do want to get to the project itself, but I want to talk about process because I said to you, my viewers have great ideas and I want some of them to run with their ideas. So. Great. Give, us a, give us a little bit about what it takes to take an idea, form an organization, create a board, set up a process. Tell, give us a little bit about how that worked for you and how, how you got things done. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, and you will fail multiple times and you will have big setbacks and you will scream into your pillow and, and you will have amazing days where you're on a complete high and you know the world is your oyster. Um, so it is that roller coaster and to be prepared for the kind of resilience that's needed. Um, my story is that the White House project actually closed down. It, it had a very strong founder. Um, she's an amazing woman. I consider her my political mentor. Um, but like many nonprofits, did not have a secession plan in place that left it in a, in a healthy place. And so uh, when the White House project closed its doors, many of us who were working abroad or you know working in different sectors came back together. Um, I pulled a group of former colleagues and friends together. We went to uh, Duluth, Minnesota where we're actually incorporated as our nonprofit and, you know, sat by one of the Great Lakes and plotted and plot, you know, how we were going to do this in a new way, uh, how we were going to use technology, how we were going to go after women who were doing um, different kinds of activism, but were not yet actualizing it into running for office and how we were going to be singularly focused on running for office. Um, and some, what were some of the lessons learned? So we spent two, three days together, um, you know, everybody paid their way to get there. It was sort of a, a real commitment on about five of our parts to do so. Did a lot of phone calls to a lot of people about, um, 
you know, would you want to be a part of this? And had to go around and sell it. Um, you know, and had to take time away from doing consulting work and making money um, and do the kind of personal finance that comes with anybody who wants to start a new thing to say, I'm going to give myself six months to get this off the ground. Um, my colleague and dear friend and co-founder Liz Johnson and I started to do the hustle. Um, we got a big grant from someone called the Omidyar Network, took a real risk on us, which was uh, a big seed grant that allowed us to, um, you know, to get our bearings straight, to get incorporated. We did go back to some former donors um, and made the pitch just we need, you know, $25,000 just to get some travel money. Um, and so we, we, we reached out to our connections um, and we, we sold it. Um, and in the last three years, I think we're just truly hitting our stride right now. Um, any organization that um, in the nonprofit sector will tell you that you start to hum around year three. And I can feel the, the humming now. Um, you, you try out a few things, you throw the spaghetti up on the wall, you iterate, and um, you make choices about what it is that you're really good at. And you're constantly assessing the landscape. So, you know, prior to the presidential election, um, when we thought Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidency, we had a very different plan. Um, and when November 9th happened, we had to, we had a conference call 8.30 the next morning. Some of us had only slept two or three hours. Um, but we hopped on the phone that morning and said, you know, our work is now more critical than ever. Um, it's, it's time to really rethink the sort of cultural landscape that we are training women in, and we need to be prepared. Um, and so we set up a series of conversations and began to really listen to women who reached out to us in the weeks and days following the election to deliver programming um, that actually in a short amount of time tra trained about 2,000 women in just a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So that nimbleness, I think, is also something that folks need to, to know about as they're, you can't be totally wed to your idea. The idea three years ago is very different than what it is looking like now. No, you have to be nimble. And you have to have a good board. So you put a board together. How do you go about assembling your board and what kind of talents do you want on your you board? You know, I'm dealing with that sort of board growth right now. The board is primarily um, former colleagues and co-founders. So in the beginning, it had been um, a board that really said, okay, we're going to say yes to you. We're going to give you a lot of leeway. You're going to be able to take a lot of risks. Um, and we're going to try a lot of things. And now we're actually going through a process of having the more um, traditional board where we're getting people from different sectors and we're interviewing. Um, so for the first three years, we kept a pretty quiet board. Um, we built an advisory board of influential names, you know, folks like Jane Swift, former governor of Massachusetts, the head of government affairs at Target, Jimmy Briggs from the Man Up campaign, um, you know, and men and women who could give me a, a kind of counsel that I needed. But we kept a really small um, and sort of family-friendly board, if you will, that knew who I was, knew what my goals were, and were able to give me a lot of rope. Great. Well, you've done, a, you've done an amazing job, and uh, being nimble and, and ready to uh, turn on a dime on a November 9, as you said. All right, so vote, run, lead. Uh, give, give me your elevator spit, your sure. elevator pitch. Yep. Vote Run Lead is a training powerhouse for women who want to run for state and local office, and we train you to run as you are. We believe you have the skills, the talents, the networks, all of it to run and to win, and we're just going to give you the, what you need um, to actually know how to campaign, to campaign successfully, and to do it in a way that um, aligns with your personal values. Um, we're nonpartisan. Our approach is individualized, so women feel like they're really getting um, something that they can take home to their real lives. We understand women. And we do it in a, you know, we do it for rural women. We, we talk specifically about the barriers to black women, to um, LGBTQ women. And we bring in experts when we don't, aren't the best on it. We make sure that we're putting the best in front of our folks at our trainings across the country. Now, now when I do have programs, and I've had a few that are, are, you know, on the side of trying to get women to run. But I, I like to tell my, my male viewers, you can still go on your website and learn 99% yes. of the message here, correct? It's all yeah. there for a man who wants to run too, right? And we have a lot of men who do take the online classes in, because they're running women's campaigns and they actually understand that this is different. She is gonna get more questions about where her kids are. She is gonna get the question about why isn't she married when she's running against a guy who also isn't married. Um, and so the campaign managers, while you're still predominantly male, need to be taking these courses and seeing what some of these differences are going to be. Um, and some of the polls in, on women's lives around care, whether that's for aging parents or families, um, is going to change the amount of time she's able to, to put on the campaign trail. So you're called vote, run, lead, not run, win, lead. There's a vote in there. What's, what's the vote right. part? So the, the vote part is really to 
sort of have the conversation, talk about how women's political capital right now is is almost 90% in voting. Um, the women's vote that everyone goes after as if we're some sort of monolithic block, you know, chasing a soccer ball like little five-year-olds on a field. Um, so getting women to realize that we have a lot more political capital than simply as a voting block, that we actually can be the ones who are running for office. Um, and with the November 9th um, results, November 8th results, we have sort of moved away from the voting and really focused on the running and leading and have, are using partners. So for example, we're partnering with um, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda on their uh, We Rise initiative for Hispanic Heritage Month this month. Um, and that's helping, um, I think the network is 44 Latino organizations across the country and putting out the uh, voter registration drive that they're doing month long. And so we're talking to um, the Latinas in our network and everyone that loves Latinas to get make sure that the Latinas in their family and their friend network are registered to vote. So primarily we're using partnerships now because we had 9,000 women raise their hand and say, I want to run for office and an unprecedented amount of, num uh, amount of women. And you know, going back to the process piece on running a nonprofit, you have limited resources. And so when something like that comes up, you have to make choices about where you're going to allocate those resources given the demand. Okay, so you're talking about women raising their hand, and I assume some women are watching the show today. We're on Facebook Live. Yeah. How do you raise your hand? What do you do? Or how does a how do woman you raise, your raise hand? her hand? How does a woman sure. raise her hand? What does she do? She can uh, sign up for one of our upcoming classes. Um, she can simply get on our mailing list, and she will, um, you know, of course, see information. Or she can go to voterunlead.org/learn, and she will find 40 odd web classes that are free and accessible. For her to watch. The first thing I would do is um, 10 things to ask yourself before running for office. That's both a blog post and an online class. The second thing I would do is the 90 day challenge, which is 30 actions in 90 days to accelerate your political capital in your community. Everything from setting up your Twitter account and you know, following 15 reporters who actually report on politics um, to having you know, coffees with folks in your community and establishing your relationships with people in different parties. Um, and so there's a variety of actions in there. Um, and then we have, you know, some basic stuff on this is how you run for office. That is a panel of women who ran and won in the uh, 2017 elections and the basic overviews. For those who are, you know, a little bit more of a political uh, seasoned folks, we've got really in-depth fundraising and finance, um, which is sort of is the next step when people say, yeah, I, you know, I've been in politics, but how would I raise $15,000 to run for my city council? So we've got a series of uh, classes you can begin to take. You don't have to wait for us. You don't have to come to anything. You can do it right after this interview. Okay, so they go online, and I've been on the website. It's a great website, again, voterunlead.org, and you have these training programs, and you say you start with the 10 things to ask yourself. I've had conversations with people uh, about why more women don't run. What, what's your sense of that initial hurdle that it takes to make I, that leap? I think, yeah, the initial hurdle that we hear the sort of underlining thing of the initial hurdle is, is it worth it? Is it is some of the BS that comes with politics worth the impact? Um, we haven't been seeing government be effective. And women want to give their time and energy and resources to things that are going to get done. Um, we often in our workshops will say, we put the, de put the word ambition up on the board and, and throw up the Merriam-Webster definition. And the first one is the desire for, you know, rank, fame, power. How many, how many folks associate with that? You get one or two hands. The second definition in the in the dictionary is the desire for impact, change, right? That it's a that do you want to get something done? Everyone in the room raises their hand. So what we see is sort of one of the biggest barriers is we have to show people that they can be effective with putting their leadership and their talents into local and state government, um, and that's been, that's that's a tough sell. <laughs> um, but after again after the election, I think people decided okay, I haven't been paying attention. And this, you know, either my issue is under attack or um, I, I'm fearful of major budget cuts. I don't like the direction our democracy is going. Or for many women that we saw who could relate to uh, an underqualified, you know, man losing to an overqualified woman. We see that a lot in our private sector lives where, you know, we've gone up for a promotion and we've lost to someone who has 10 or 15 years less experience than we have. So those are some of the motivations that changed for us, and all of a sudden it became really worth it to run for political office and to get involved. Now, you may have mentioned this because you've thrown so much at my viewers and me. I, I may, I'm not catching everything here. One of the threshold questions has to be, what office do I actually want to run for? How do you help them figure that out? 
Great. Okay, so we have two classes on that online. What office do I want to run for? It comes up all the time. The number one answer is you can only run where you live. You have a very specific geography about who represents you. So one is to do that Googling. There's great organizations. I know you're involved with Ballotpedia. Um, there's some new apps out that have some of this information. Nation Builder has some of this information. So finding that. Um, but the second piece is asking yourself, what do I care about? What are the top three issues that are important to me and where do those issues get legislated? So, you know, you may, your issues may be school related, but you may find that it's actually the state legislature that controls that particular budget. You care deeply about infrastructure and you've never heard of the county commission before. So figuring out where the top three things that you care about get legislated. Um, the next thing to look at is your leadership style. You know, are you willing to be an executive leader, run for county executive, run for mayor? Um, or are you someone who works better in teams and is able to pull three or four of your colleagues on a seven person city council? So we go through some of those questions um, on a workshop called what office should I run for? Um, that is also free and online. Um, and most people, you know, I think the other thing we get is, should I move? Um, you know, I love my elected representative. I don't want to run against them. Uh, and we talk to folks about, are you willing to move to the next town over? Um, you know, I'm in New York City. Are you willing to go home to where you came from? Uh, you know, at some of these major metropolitan areas, are you ready to go back out to rural communities and consider running for office um, back, you know, where you were born and raised? So those are some of the th conversations we have when it comes to what office should I run for? So you go on the website, again, uh, voterunlead.org, you've got these great tutorials, and that's part of bringing technology, as you said, to the process. But you have hands-on uh, sessions that people can go to, and I know you have a couple coming up. Why don't you give my viewers a sense of what they can do if they want more hands-on, sure. want to go on all day. Sure, absolutely. So if you happen to be in Manchester, New Hampshire, or anywhere in New Hampshire this Saturday, please join us. Um, we're really excited to partner with the New Hampshire Women's Foundation to bring a day-long training to, uh, to Manchester, but the big national event, a couple hundred women will be in Minneapolis this year, November 17, 18, 19, and it is called Run As You Are. So if you're thinking about running in the next few years or you have your eye on a seat, this is for you. Um, you're gonna walk out of there with a personalized campaign plan, you're gonna get your questions answered, you're gonna be really pumped up by other amazing women um, who are going to join you. And um, we've got 25 trainers from across the country. We have that rural women's leadership track we're partnering with a, a group called Higher Heights to develop a particular African-American women leaders cohort. Um, and so there's a lot of specialized information that you'll get and you'll leave feeling really capable and really proud and, and ready to actually either build that capital for a race in 2020 or a state legislative race in 2018, or you'll get a real boost to your current campaign. Is there a cost associated with that program? Yes, it is $165 for three days, uh, which is below cost. So we really tried to make it quite affordable. Um, and there are travel stipends available um, and a couple of scholarships with some of our partners. So I, I go online, I get trained, I'm all ready to go. And I go to Minneapolis and I'm all ready to go. All right, but now I'm running for office. Do you have okay. a next for these people? Do you hook them up sure. with mentors and other people that can take them to the next level? The next level stuff for us is really the peer network. So get connected inside the Facebook community connected to women in your geography who are going to support you, take all those business cards that you got, take the actions of building those relationships. Hopefully we've taught you well to build relationships with political parties. You know how to talk to PACs, you know how to get endorsements. You've hopefully interviewed a couple of folks. Maybe it's just your husband who will be your campaign manager, but you should interview him too. Um, and begin to actualize some of the things that we're talking about. Um, as a 501c3 charitable organization, we don't directly help candidates because of the tax status stuff, um, but we do make our networks very available for folks to access, and it will get you in the door to say, I'm a Vote Run Lead alumni, I'd like to have a conversation with you. So you're on the educational side. Now, now, my, per now my personal bias, and what a lot of my show is about, is my vision is that the two-party system isn't working, and I'm trying to get people to think about running as third-party or independent. Yes. How much time do you spend educating on those points? Well, I, I think personally I'm very much in agreement with you. I, I, I really believe what we're doing at Vote Run is building women's independent political power. Um, we trust women to develop their own agendas. We trust women to pick their political parties. We have very frank conversations about the Democratic and Republican Party. Um, there are, we, and we have a few predictions about what's going to happen. A lot more women are going to run for office, and not a lot of them are going to win this first time around because there will be heavy primaries in which five or six or seven people are running actively. 
And if you haven't been putting in your 15 years to say the Democratic Party, it's unlikely that you're going to get the kind of resources that are needed in a primary. So what are the ways in which you can circumvent that and figure out, are there new folks that you should be registering to vote? Um, are there new populations? Um, do you want to get, you know, how can you get a different kind of endorsement from a newspaper or a big organization that can counteract that? How do you go and kiss the ring anyway to the chair of the party and make yourself known, um, but also be able to hold them accountable? Um, and same thing, we, we, there's research for Republican women. Moderate Republican women get killed in primaries. And so what are the avenues to build that political power, get those votes without having the party infrastructure that women are not often given? And, and, and I tell you what I tell people that come to me thinking of running for office, I always say to them, I want you to do this, go do it, do it the right way, but plan on running twice. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really tough thing for women. The loss is, is much harder um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's, there's research on why, but I, I think um, what's important is that we talk about what it means to run and win. Does winning actually mean that you are going to get in that seat in this election? Does winning mean that you are representing voices in your community and getting the agenda changed and getting your current representative to actually talk about the things that he should be or she should be? Um, or is it about um, you know the name recognition for the long game? Talking to a lot of first-time candidates right now who want to run for Congress in 2018, um, and you know what what they're actually running for is 2020, and that's okay too. No, no, again, I'm all about that. I think you have to be prepared to do that. And it, it pains me when I see people who run only once and then they get out. Someone needed to have schooled them in advance that this is, you've got to be prepared for a two-cycle thing. If you scratch most successful politicians in, in the United States today, yeah. they have lost somewhere along the line. Yes, absolutely. So, Aaron, you've been a great guest, and I want to make you, give you time for one last sales pitch here. So tell my viewers... Uh, how to get involved in the organization, about the website, and your up, again, about your up-training programs. Great. Up programs. Head, go to VoteRunLead.org. Sign up for the national training. If you're even thinking about running for office, come. It'll be the most transformative three days of your life. You can count on that. Um, start to dabble on the website. Find the resources that you might need to think about what office to run for. Start to have those conversations with your friends and family. You will be pleasantly surprised how amazing everyone actually thinks you are. Um, and give us a, a call. Our telephone numbers are up there. Our emails are up there. Reach out. We have a beautiful network across the country. And then uh, our Facebook alumni group, after you've participated with us, you get connected to about 1,500 other women who are actively having this conversation in a private way. You know, I, 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 we're going to run out of time here, but uh, off camera, I'd like to talk to you because what I did uh, with the Women's Candidate School at Yale University is I then interviewed someone that went through her, their program. Maybe right. I could interview right. a few of the people who have gone through the program, sure. some of the success stories, and get, yeah. have people get that side as well. So we're, we're most proud of Ilhan Omar, the Somali-American representative out of Minnesota, um, who has been through several of our programs over the years and um, you know, is sort of the most famous local elected official right now. So we're very proud that she's wearing our, our T-shirt and such in you know, People magazine. It's, it's pretty thrilling. Well, thank you. All the best. Uh, uh, you're an amazing ambassador for your uh, program, and uh, I think with you in the lead, uh, Vote Run Lead is going to definitely get somewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed today's interview with Erin. Uh, if nothing else, uh, her passion just uh, screams through the screen at us. And when you hear the numbers about the women, I think she said 8,000 people are in this latest iteration. Uh, trying to get involved to make a difference. And again, on our show, that's what we're trying to get you to do. Uh, you know what? Even if you don't want to run for office, why don't you at least put your toe in the water here and go to the website, uh, look at some of the stuff they're talking about. Maybe you have a good friend that you won't know wants to run for office, and you'll get involved with them, and you can run the campaign, they can run for office. But this is what I say is the highest form of civic engagement you can do. This is the best thing you can do to get involved and make our democracy better, as Aaron said, make our government better because it's just not working right now, and this is what has to happen. And if nothing else, maybe get involved with Aaron's organization and do some of this voter registration, get people to the polls. Uh, if you want to catch up on some of our other shows, uh, we're on Grassroots TV in Aspen, Colorado, and you can uh, look at their website at Grassroots TV. Uh, we're on Facebook through Facebook Live. This program is running live as we're talking today. And then noneoftheabove.us, which is my website. So we have a lot of outlets, a lot of outlets to catch this information. And again, get involved. We bring in new solutions, but you've got to take the next step. Remember, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem.